Great. Hello, my name is Christina Haswood. I'm a candidate for the Kansas House Representative in District 10. My pronouns are she and hers. Thanks for everyone for hopping on to our community conversations. I'm incredibly excited for Michelle De La Isla here, congressional candidate, as well as mayor for Topeka um, to join us today. Um, just so you all know, we are recording these conversations. So folks who are unable to make it um, can tune in later and give anyone who wants to turn off their camera again at this time, um, please do so. And for about the first 30 minutes, um, we do, I have some questions that I prepared for her, um, but if you guys have questions anytime during this, uh, during this series, uh, go ahead and put it in the chat box or save it for later. And um, so we'll leave about the last 20 minutes for questions. And if you do have any questions, we'll go ahead and do like a raise the hand function. So I first want to welcome our guest, Mayor of Topeka, Michelle De La Isla, who is running for U.S. House right here in Congressional District 2. Um, and I'm so excited to meet her. I want to first say that I probably shared this with, um, you know, Michelle, that I have personally tried to go to DC and meet with our congressmen. Um, I, uh, mainly about indigenous issues. Um, I had an internship there last summer, would knock on that door, open that door, say, hello, I'm a constituent, you work for me, first of all, and was met with not much of you know, willingness to hear about my issues. I did get meetings with the staffers, but they were just like, uh-huh, 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 okay. Um, anyways, so I was really excited to see Michelle step up. And I actually first saw you at the Washington Days in Kansas Democrats um, back in, what was that, March or February? <laughs> yeah, it was a year and a half ago, it feels like, right? <laughs> Maybe yeah. 10 years ago? <laughs> Maybe. And um, I know you spoke at one of the lunches and you had everybody on, on their feet and everyone clapping. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I had to put down like that nice yummy food and iced tea and like get up and clap with her. And I was so excited. Um, and I think that's one of the unique qualities that you bring um, to Kansas and to this district and as well as bringing hope and qualifications. I'm very excited to see a woman of color too. Um, representation matters to me. Um, and I think, you know, making politics fun, um, you're really bringing that. So I know I've already talked enough, but if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the people who might not know you, now would be great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christina. It's such an honor to be here with you. I'm so proud of your accomplishment of being bold enough to put yourself out there to run for office is nothing short of inspiring. Um, and just the same way that I was watching uh, Kamala Harris in the vice presidential debates. And the last question was so impactful because I, I just could imagine any number of girls that might've been sitting there with their parents and looking at this phenomenal woman to speak in the role of future, potential future uh, vice president was just something inspiring. So when I see you, um, I think of all the little girls that are looking at you and knowing that they have a role model to look up to. So I'm super excited to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Michelle de la Isla. I am indeed the mayor of the city of Topeka and currently running for Congress in Kansas District 2. Excited to be running in this district. I've met nothing but beautiful people all across the district, everywhere from Blue Rapids to, uh, to down to, um, oh gosh, my brain is dead right now. Um, everywhere down to uh, Pittsburgh, um, just been able to just meet such beautiful people, uh, beautiful people across the district. And the, the, the concerns are the same. Um, I think that everybody is concerned about trying to make sure that they have access to good health care, that they are able to have good education for their families and their children, um, that the people are able to have a good job. And I think that the number one thing on everybody's mind right now is trying to figure out how we get rid of COVID so that we can get back to life as normal. Because I tell you, it's, it's uncomfortable to be walking around with a mask. And I think that we're all exhausted. Um, it makes everything a little bit more complicated and it makes things, uh, it makes you realize the value of, of human interaction. Um, which I hope is something that we remember when we get back together uh, and to cherish each other. 
Um, a little bit about me, I was born in New York, I was raised in Puerto Rico, and I have been in Kansas for almost half of my life now. So I am a Kansan, uh, Kansarican, um, and um, just love this state. I got my degree from Wichita State University. Uh, I know firsthand what it is to have a life full of challenges. I've been homeless, uh, was pregnant at the age of 20, um, had my first battle with a really chronic condition, the big C. Um, when I was young, I was 22, 23 years old. Um, and these are the experiences that have shaped my viewpoint of people and, um, and of programs and of systems. Uh, and that's why I'm so impassionate about serving people. Kansans uh, were a significant part of my life turning out the way that it has. I would have never imagined that I would be running for Congress in this great state. Um, obviously, I, I am not the first image that you would think of when you would think of a Congresswoman, but you know, I think that um, we are excited about the progress that we're making and the fact that we have a great opportunity this year of taking this seat that Paul did so much work to work for. Um, he's a man that I owe so much to, and I'm ever grateful for him and for his support and the work that he's done um, but my, my main issues, my, the reason that I decided to run is healthcare. Um, I think that we all, before the pandemic was even a, an issue, um, healthcare was the number one thing. The pandemic has doubled down on that desire and just making sure that we have, um, individuals that are able to thrive in their communities. So that's me. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing your story. Um, I think a lot of us resonate with your background and we can take a little piece of everything and it has built you to a phenomenal woman um and what i really think that you would leave our congressional district well and be that voice that that needs to be up there especially now um during all these social justice issues um my first question is can you start off by telling us the day that you realized that you wanted to run for congress or maybe that day where you have to start telling people, I'm gonna do it. Because for me, I remember that day and it changed my life. I actually, I was talking about it today this morning and I was like, I actually cried because I knew my life was gonna change. You know, you know, things might be a little different, um, but it was scary as well. And telling people that you're gonna run is, is kind of scary because you don't know if people are gonna support you or not. Um, and I know like Congresswoman Sharice Davis tells a story where she was trying to find every single person that she thought was qualified to run and they didn't want to run for Congress. So she's like, okay, I'm qualified. And she started off at like a kitchen table and pretty much, you know, she is a rock star today. <laughs> so do yes, you have she that, is. Yeah, that similar story. <laughs> um, actually I do. Um, so a lot of people may or may not know this, but um, I was, very happy working at Evergy. Uh, I was doing supplier diversity work, which is some what I consider equity work. I was able to connect minority businesses with the company to help them prosper and was leading some efforts in Topeka as well with these things. Um, and I was, you know, doing, uh, having a fun time being the mayor of the city, serving my community. So the last thing that I thought was that I was going to end up running for Congress. And I was asked I think it was, gosh darn it, I think it was not, it was after the 2018 election. Um, the first person that really pulled me aside uh, was John Gibson, who used to be the executive director of the party. And we had lunch and he said, um, have you considered doing this? And I just remember looking at him saying, no, no, thanks, but no. And um, I was like, look, my life is, is, is great. I have a great job. I'm able to pay my bills. I'm able to take care of my kids, which is my number one concern. Um, I'm really enjoying being mayor. I, I don't think that, you know, that it's something that I think I could do. And it was last year that it was in August. And I remember that Nicole, my best friend, um, decided to take a look at the district and take a look at where the numbers were missing and um, what the routes were because the conversation kept happening all of 2019. And we sat in the kitchen table uh, in my kitchen island and I was sitting there and we called uh, our other best friend, Jen, and us three girls, like it, it was in a yellow legal pad piece of paper. And Jen looks at the numbers and the statistics 
and we go like this to Jennifer and she goes, oh, we're doing this, aren't we? <laughs> and, uh, and that was, so, so the, the, the first thought process was, well, let me see what the district thinks. And so I, we sent out close to 400 letters just to see um, what people thought about the prospect of me running. And I was extremely surprised to see that people were excited. And even the day before I announced, which I think was a Monday, um, I remember going to Pittsburgh just to see what people thought. Because uh, I said, look, I'm not going to focus just on Topeka, Shawnee County, and the, and the urban areas. To me, the rural communities matter significantly. Um, whether there's a lot of voters or not a lot of voters, if you guys don't feel like we can talk and communicate about your needs and you think that I can't represent you, then it really doesn't make any sense for me to run. And I remember telling my, my kids that Sunday after I drove home, the day because I told them, I said, look, I can stand up in that podium and say, I'm going to run, or I can say, I have evaluated the prospect of running for Congress and I'm not going to do it. And it hit me when I said it. Uh, in front of the cameras, I broke down, I choked up, got pretty emotional looking at my daughters and, you know, saying, because I told them, I said, we could do either. And, and if you don't, if you don't feel ready, girls, for me to do this, I will not do it. And they were like, hurry up and let's go. We're doing this. Um, so to say it, like you're saying, to say it was extremely emotional, because like you said, it, it changes your life. And especially right now in this environment that everything is so ugly. Um, it's, it's, it's an act of valor. And that's why I admire you so much as well. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, I'm glad that you had a similar <laughs> realization that what are, what are we getting ourselves into? I actually did the same thing when I got asked, I called my best friend. She lives in Arizona. And I was like, what do you think about this girl? Because I don't know if I can do this for myself. <laughs> um, so the second question. Um, so we're kind of, we're going to dive into a little brief history lesson. I feel like voter education is very important um and people don't really get that education in the k-12 through school systems of knowing like the state government um and then like what you do as a mayor and then what you're doing as congress um like when we look at an issue um i guess sometimes when i do phone banking people tell me um if i can fix an issue that's more of a federal level issue um so you know if, if you think healthcare is probably one of our biggest issues, do you think you can break it down into how it's addressed maybe at the mayor level and at the congressional level, and if you know much about the state level? So absolutely. The, the, the first thing that I like to do, I like, I like things simple. So for people to get a grasp of what each level of government does, the city is pretty much in charge of fire, police, roads, neighborhoods, and economic development at the local level. So making sure that we are able to attract businesses into our community based on the quality of life that we're providing for people. So when you talk about health access, um, you have a smaller layer at the county level because the county typically is the one that holds um, the department, the health department, but you really don't have a lot of access uh, into working with policy that has to do with healthcare. Now, when you go up to the state, the main part of that budget is the budget of education. Um, and the school systems, both university and uh, elementary school, the majority of the state's budget goes into those things. Um, and the other thing that the state does is that it has the policy of holding the state level of, of medical care, that is what we consider the Medicaid, which in, in Kansas was can care, um, it provides a level of care for families. And in addition to this, there's federal dollars that come into states that then are disbursed uh, so that the states can make policies on how they want those dollars to be allocated. Um, then at the federal level, you have the big look at healthcare. Uh, federal level is more with regards to issues of, of um, so like when you think about how we manage the budget, what I hate the word entitlements, but um, food stamps, uh, the SNAP program, 
Um, all of those things really trickle down from the federal level on how those, those dollars are going to be sent to states. Uh, CDBG programs are federal. Affordable housing programs come from the federal level. Um, so with the healthcare, it's the overall policy. Uh, the, the federal level holds Medicare, which is when you're over 65, is the insurance that you have been paying into. Do not let anybody tell you that it's a socialist benefit because you pay into Medicare uh, with every single paycheck. Um, so that benefit of healthcare after you're 65, but also one of the cornerstones that we've had in our democracy is the signage of the Affordable Health Care Act. And a lot of people don't understand that the Affordable Health Care Act is what has allowed many Americans, millions of Americans to have access to healthcare. When that legislation was written, it was written in two parts. And here is where people get confused. That legislation created an exchange so that companies can help provide insurance that was reduced or that could be subsidized if you showed that you had inability to pay the subsidy. Because they knew that people were not going to qualify for the public option, which is Medicaid or can care in Kansas, there were dollars sent called Medicaid expansion that were going to help people that were in the middle that were gonna be charged for that exchange program to take care of those funds so that people could have access to healthcare. And the importance of what's happening in the exchange is that before this legislation was passed, if you had a pre-existing condition like me, it was prohibited to get yourself health insurance on your own unless you were employed by a corporation. And this single legislation eliminated that barrier. Now, it was meant to be passed with Medicaid expansion dollars that would help cover people that didn't qualify for Medicaid. Um, and that's where we see 150,000 Kansans struggle. So when you talk about healthcare at the state level, the, the Congress and the, and the Senate have the ability to negotiate uh, our clauses that would allow us to negotiate prescription drugs. Um, and we also have the ability to protect your pre-existing conditions through the vehicle that we have in action. But most importantly, I have to make sure that those Medicaid expansion dollars that are allocated to the states are still available when I'm there and after. Yeah, thank you so much for explaining that. Um, we can see how even one issue that you know, might be the big hot topic in Kansas actually spreads out to all levels of government. Um, and it's a very complex issue as well. Um, but just goes to show to see, you know, that you continue to vote for people who want this forward thinking and positivity. I don't know if any of you guys on tonight have another issue that you would like um, Michelle to discuss about. Um, feel free to put in the chat. I know there's, you know, a laundry list of other issues that are extremely important that don't get the spotlight that that uh, maybe our races or on social media deserve. Um, but I'm gonna go on to the next question. And can you just tell us what an average day is for you as mayor and an average day for you as a candidate? <laughs> Do you really wanna know? <laughs> Remember I told you I was tired when we started this call? Um, so typical day for me, I'll end up waking up sometime around, I don't know, depends on the day, but like the sweet spot typically is somewhere around 637. And then I try to work out for a minimum of 30 minutes. If I get up earlier, I try to work out a little bit longer. I love, uh, I'm, I'm frustrated that the pools are now, you know, closed because it's so cold, but I love, I love triathlons. So I, I stay, you know, on a regular doing one of those three things. Um, then after that, I start looking at emails, trying to figure out from the city, what are the things that are happening in that day by seven 30, I already have my calendar from my assistant. Um, I know exactly all the places that I have to divide myself by, um, my girls are pretty independent. Uh, they drive. So they, by this time have woken up and left the house and they're in school because school started again. Uh, if not, I will go upstairs because I live in the uh, in the house and, you know, just go upstairs and talk to the girls and uh, catch up with them before I leave. Um, 
And then it's meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. And now with the campaign is meeting, forum, meeting, uh, call time, call time, call time, forum, fundraiser, call time, mom, city work, try to sleep so that the next day happens. Um, so today is a good example of that. Um, today, my daughters were playing in regionals. Uh, they're tennis players. But I also had meetings in the morning. My first meeting today was at 730 in the morning. So I was in my meeting while I was on my treadmill. Um, and then after that meeting, I came here for a forum. Then after that forum, I had to go to see my daughter play tennis before I had a lunch meeting with a business project that came to the community, then came back, had another interview. Then after that, there's some call time and I've done two events back to back. And now I'm you know, waiting to talk to the girls to see what we're gonna do tonight to spend some time together. Um, so it's crazy, it's, it's crazy. Um, oh, and I forgot the fact that I'm also part of Shawnee County COVID response. So the meetings not only fluctuate from the city, but I have an everyday noon meeting, unless I have like today, a meeting outside of the office um, that I do with the county and with other community partners on top of the other community meetings that I do to keep people involved on the same page with COVID, which includes superintendents, churches, uh, business owners, I mean, you name it. Uh, so yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a long, very, uh, you, I call it like compartment boxes. I, I can't say that I have one box that I like stay in this box for a while and go to the other. I'm literally jumping from box to box throughout the whole day. Oh my God. Are you okay? <laughs> oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> Was your like workload the same or I guess maybe a dial before when you were mayor or... Well, I'm still the mayor, that's the deal. That's why I still work city and work the campaign. Now, when I was working at Evergy, um, it was a little bit more measured, but then again, we didn't have a COVID response that we were dealing with at the same time. Um, so it's, it's a completely different environment. I often joke and I say, you know, to the rest of the world, I'm sorry. Uh, I decided to run for Congress and because nothing in my life ever comes easy. Um, we have a pandemic in the midst of everything else that's happening. I'm joking, but. You know, it almost feels that way. It's 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 been incredibly complicated to to be able to juggle all these balls. Twenty five days and counting. Yeah, and how do you manage your like stress or what brings po positivity to your day? So you mentioned exercise and your daughter. Yes, yes both of those. Um, so I am very fortunate. I have. My two best friends, well, my sister here is a professor at Washburn, uh, not my blood sister. She's my, my sister of the soul. Um, and then my two best friends, Nicole and Ryan, um, and Jennifer is also in that group. Uh, we have like this family kind of environment. Um, I have a very small circle of people. Nate and Sheena Schmidt are another group of those individuals that are part of like this very small circle that like on, on one day of the week, Nate and Sheena make dinner for me. Um, and then, and for the girls. So we all head over there and we all just sit down and just we're loved on and we love on each other, you know, just being supportive. Um, Ryan and Nicole know when I need a glass of whiskey, um, you know, or, or Nicole is really good to make sure that if I'm tired, she is, she's like my sister. I mean, she just like, calls me first thing in the morning and it's like, are you up? We need to bike ride because if you don't ride or if you don't run, you're not going to be okay. So I'm heading to your house. I'm going to be there. And if you're not up and moving, I'm going to wake you up and turn the light on. And I'm like, ah! but, but that's what keeps me going. And of course my kids, my kids are my source of, of life. I felt that too. Um, in my primary, that's where a lot of my competitiveness was and my campaign manager was the one, you know, saying, are you doing this? Are you doing this now? You should be doing this now. If not, then let's hop on a Zoom so I know that you're, so I can watch you do it. <laughs> um, yeah. It's weird. Yeah, definitely. But it's nice to have a team around you um, to keep you accountable. Um, so that's, oh, yeah. that's great to hear. And um, I brought this up previously, but is there other issues or maybe passion issues um, that you don't get to really talk about? 
that you're really passionate about and excited to probably be working on in Congress? You know, I think that the the biggest thing, I'm, I'm extremely passionate about inclusion. Uh, and, and I don't even call it inclusion because inclusion makes the, it gives somebody the opportunity to invite you. I believe in belonging um, and um, equity and belonging. And I am looking forward to being in Congress and start to create pockets of, of, of bringing people back together. Um, I really believe in unity. I really believe that it's okay to disagree. I, I'm, I'm a person that loves. So like one of, some of my good, good friends are like super Republican, like Trump loving Republican. And I love them. I absolutely love them. Um, Tom is a great example. We have, sometimes we haven't had it in a while, but we used to have coffee before the pandemic on a regular basis. And, you know, in the end, we all were talking about the same things, you know, here's the picture of my grandkids and here's how everything is going. And once in a while, we have a discourse with regards to my position on something and their position on something. And then at the end of the day, we just remember that we're still humans and we love each other and we move on. And I think that my passion and my, my heart, my, it's, it's all about how do I get to DC and, and start working with people that believe that it's okay not to always agree without dehumanizing ourselves. Um, that I think is crucial. Um, I'm excited about being able to do that. Uh, God willing, if I get elected, when I get elected, um, because because belonging is really important to me. And I think that if we start modeling that, we're going to start seeing a significant turnaround because when 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 we're able to treat each other as humans, um, good things happen. Thank you for sharing. Definitely, you know, after this administration leaves, there will be some healing that needs to be taken place. And um, I, I've heard that too, that belonging and inclusion that wording and changing that wording and what that really means in the definition of it. Um, yeah, that, that's great. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so what advice would you give to young people who want to, who want to seek political office? Um, I recently had a girl who contacted me saying that she wants to run for Congress and she's 25. I was like, well, I ran for state office. I don't know how much I can help you, <laughs> but it was, you know, someone needs to tell someone like you can do it. Um, so what advice would you give to young people that want to seek a political office? So the advice that I would give to young people that want to seek political office is the first thing that you need to do is understand governance. And to do that, there is no better place to do it than starting to volunteer in your local favorite place. And why do I say volunteer? For like, for example, let's say that you're interested, like I am two things that will always make me stop. I go crazy stupid for dogs and babies. Uh, I mean, I see a dog and I have not met a dog that I did not want to pet. Um, even the ones that look kind of angry, at first, I'm like, it's okay. It's okay, I'm not gonna hurt you. Here, smell my hand. Um, so, so for example, somebody that would like to work at the Humane Society, for example, I would invite them to go and volunteer. Why? Because first you start learning how the business runs. And then when you start volunteering and you understand how the business runs, then guess what you do? You try to get on the board. And then once you're on the board, you understand that whole process of, you know, it's not that the CEO gets to make all the decisions. There's a larger group of people that you have to interact with. And maybe you have an idea that is different than the rest of the group. So how do you present that idea and are able then to just start bringing people together so that they understand where you're at and create those relationships. And then you start learning how to hone in what your talents are. And then when you start doing that, you have the benefit that people that sometimes are running for office for the first time have never had. Um, you know, little things like learning the robber's rules of order and learning about um, just the way that people communicate in a boardroom is so important. And all of those skills are 100% transferable to running for elected office. And if, if you want to run for Congress, I, I would never tell somebody, hey, if you've never run before, run a few things before and, and kind of get a grasp. But I always recommend to people, if, if you want to run for a bigger office, um, unless like Sharice, she had experience working in DC. 
uh, it, it was an easy fit for her because she understood the systems. But if you've never had exposure to the systems, run for smaller offices first and kind of get that gist on what it is. And then most importantly, volunteer on a few campaigns. And that really will give you an understanding on how the campaign is run, how you raise the money, how do you organize your marketing plan, how do you do constituent services, and then after you have all that in place, you're unstoppable. Because most people don't take the time to know all this stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and is that how you got involved in politics? Were you involved like in high school or later in life? So in high school, I was a nerd, like a mega nerd. Um, I was not the, the regular kid. I used to like forensics and Shakespeare. And uh, I tried to be the newspaper editor, but I went to a Catholic school and got in trouble because I printed my opinions. Um, and, uh, oh, Burke is saying, yep, yep, I know how that feels. Um, so, so I really, and, and I was in Taekwondo, so I, I was not like a normal kid, right? Um, but then uh, I started understanding the power of volunteerism when I started working with the Habitat Board. Um, and I started volunteering for them. And I started working in a nonprofit because I never knew what the nonprofit sector was and had to start presenting to my board members. And that right there was when I started honing in those skills of understanding those relationships between the board, within the staff, um, what the expectations are. Um, and then started looking at other campaigns. And that's when I was like, ooh, I could do this. I could do this. That was probably like one of my big advices too, is um, volunteering. That's how I got, that's how I got here today. I volunteered people registering to vote and it got me here today. Um, yeah, definitely that and gaining experience as much as you can. One of my biggest things was talking to people who are in these positions or in these fields. Uh, for me, you know, always reading something gets boring, but you get more in depth and that more genuality and meeting someone face to face that can put a name to it. To, um, to your emails. Um, you know, so and the, the important thing to remember is that as you're working with people, regardless of the position, whether it's President Barack Obama, uh, whether it's Councilwoman X or B or Z, here's the deal. At the end of the day, Barack Obama is still Barack Obama. When he gets home, he's still Barack. He's dad to his daughters. Uh, he's whatever nickname uh, Michelle Obama calls him. We're still people we're still people don't don't expect like that we are going to be greater than or anything um we're just people um so approach people that you want to learn from and just don't don't, don't put anybody in a pedestal great advice great advice um so I'm going to wrap up my set of questions with some lighthearted questions if ever everyone in the audience wants to think of their questions you want to put in the chat box or get get it get it going in your head so how do you take your coffee and are you a coffee drinker <laughs> all the time <laughs> all day coffee all day um so <laughs> as you can tell I'm, I'm i'm very prim and proper um so there's two ways that i take my coffee i'm a coffee snob so if it's really good coffee like here locally we have a roaster uh, PT's coffee, they make like high quality pour over black coffee that you don't need to put a thing in. It's like smooth. It's like silk. Um, I like a good pour over from PT's depending on, on where, what the zone is and, and the, the ripeness of the cherries. I said snob. Now when it's run of the mill, regular, you know, good old coffee, I have to doctor it. So, uh, I like me some, some Splenda and any flavoring of, of creamer that I could get my hands on. Are you a big pumpkin spice gal? <laughs> you know, we have a Keurig and there's a pumpkin spice blend here. When I have a chance, I'll have it, but I won't go somewhere and order it. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> I know I just lost 50% of my voting base. <laughs> there goes the college kids. Okay. Yeah, there we go. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> just kidding. We love you guys. <laughs> um, so what's some of your favorite places to eat in Topeka? This is kind of for me. <laughs> oh, my God. So the, the, 
the, the best Mexican food is tacos el mexicano. It's so good. I know I made this weird face. It's just, it's so freaking good. It's so real. Um, and then if I want to have like really nice food, um, the row house has been closed, but since the row house has been closed, oh my God, Adam at the white linen has probably some of the most exquisite food that I've had in the country. Um, he is an artist. Um, he and his wife, Cassie just do art on a plate. Even my daughter will eat seafood from him and she doesn't even eat seafood from me. And I like to cook. So <laughs> that's, that's nice. I wrote those down. <laughs> um and what does your music playlist look like it's a mix so I uh I listen to like reggaeton and like uh pitbull and and you know if I'm working out because I don't like the lyrics I don't like the lyrics whatsoever so if I'm running I don't listen to what they're saying and I just listen to the boom 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 and it kind of like if I'm running especially I try to keep my beat uh to the steps uh, I love classical music. I love uh, Jason Mraz and Ed Sheeran. I think that they are able to write stories with their words. Um, and I am a huge theater freak. So um, I have a station devoted to Broadway and I know the whole play of Hamilton by heart. Uh, and I'll listen to Hamilton over and over and Wicked and In the Heights and I could keep on going. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's weird. It's, it's, it's an interesting playlist. You like Phantom of the Opera? That's I love Phantom of the Opera. I've seen that play seven times. <laughs> Lucky one day I'm gonna see it. Um, and then I asked you this before, but how do you practice self-care? I think that's, really again, it's just working out it's it's the way working out and spending time with the people that i love that remind me that even though i am being objectified as a candidate because it is objectifying right people people have an expectation of who they think you are and most importantly of who you should be um and it's been really interesting the crass and negative things that people um dare to say excuse me on social media and you just sit there and you just look and you go have we met? You know, have I have I ever done anything negative to harm you? Um, why would you ever say something like that? I would never say something like that about anybody, whether I agree or disagree. Um, and uh, and it's 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 the people that I love and that love me for me, just give me energy. And, and like I said, if I don't work out, you could tell a difference. You you could immediately. It's just like you didn't run. <laughs> Yeah, I, I kind of noticed that too. Um, people being so nasty, um, you know, not only in our races, but other races um, across the country. Um, it's weird. And then it's kind of comical when they have like Bible verses <laughs> in their social media. Um, I, I saw a lot of that and I was like, it's just like, you cannot quote the Bible and then lie in your ads. It's just like, seriously, really? How can you do that? It's, 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 you know, and not only that, how could you talk like that about other people and then say that you love Jesus? Seriously, shame on you. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at that the other day. I was like, oh, this is interesting. Um, but yeah, just campaign tactics as well. Um, yeah, but it shouldn't be. Shouldn't the American people deserve something better? Shouldn't us as a country deserve to have somebody that would be honest, whether we agree or disagree? Um, without having to make up things or demonize your opponents. Um, you know, there's enough policy out there that we could disagree upon and it's okay. Um, just the fact that somebody, anybody would have to either lie or try to demonize another human being just tells you anything you need to know. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, campaigns are weird. This is like my first time being heavily involved in a campaign. It's my own campaign. <laughs> so we were not, I guess I was expecting the attack, attacks, but um, yeah, one of my famous ones is my opponent used a picture of me in a mini skirt and spaghetti, spaghetti straps and try, try to run ads over here. <laughs> I was like, no, we're not gonna, you know, discriminate women for what they wear. So amen. Mm -hmm. And Okay, so it looks like we have one question in the chat box. We do have a great comment from um, 
you know, Dr. Portillo, who is running as a county commissioner, and she was just emphasizing that there are a number of local boards and commissions that the city and county commissioners appoint folks to. Uh, these are great opportunities for folks learning about governance, and we need more diversity on these boards. So that is Absolutely. a great point. I think ever since I became elected, we've increased 25% the diversity in our boards. Ooh, I like oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> that was interesting too. Um, me starting to get politically involved about a year ago, how there's so many board positions open in our local city. Um, and then we had, I believe, a high schooler girl saying that she was on one of the boards here in Lawrence and she kind of got criticized for being so young. But, you know, she was qualified to be on this board and they let her on the board and making these decisions. So um, it, it's great to see, you know, young people doing that. Um, you know, and that's someone who who steps up to that. I was even working with Washburn University so that we would have a youth representative on every board. We never got any traction from the leadership center, but it was an offering that they had because mm -hmm. we need to have the diversity in every sense. Mm hmm. That is, that is a big, important point. Um, next question. For both of you, what are you planning to do about climate change and trying to get the country to move away from fossil fuels? I feel like it's an uphill battle, both with Kansas and nationally, but it's something you're thinking about at least. So what are we planning to do about climate change? So here's the deal. We are in Kansas, don't be dismayed. Kansas is number three in the nation for wind energy production. And that's not a, a small feat. Um, even though we are a privately owned uh, you know, utility, uh, our utility has been working on expanding our portfolio. They even have a methane plant. Um, and there's some investments happening in solar. So I know that there is a desire to diversify the portfolio to ensure that we, the, the, I stay so, still say we when I shouldn't, but that you know the utilities that are here are going into more of a green space. The one thing that I advocate for constantly, and I keep saying it to see if you know we start getting there, is the fact that we desperately need to invest in storage and not just storage for homes. I think that we need to start investing in transmission storage research because if we're able to generate all this wind energy and we can't store it, then when there's no wind, guess what happens? Uh, we have a problem and we need to resort back to fossil fuels. Um, because what people don't understand on a regular basis is that we're not always going to have the sun. Uh, there's going to be days that are going to be overcast. We have to have a robust enough diversified portfolio of green production um, that if we do use uh, coal or any other source like gas, it's a minimal, minimal usage. Um, but until we have a way to store that energy, we're going to be in trouble. So my big push is r and on storage. Um, and not only that, I think that eventually as we start building new codes, uh, one of the things that we may have to start talking about is creating, you know, like making sure that part of the code is to have a uh, battery tax in your house. Um, so that not only do you have to have the, the regular, but also your houses are now being built with the ability for you to have a storage unit in your own home. Um, so there's, there's things like that that you can start putting policy and support into. Um, but in order for us to do that, we need to make those batteries a lot more inexpensive. Um, and uh, we need to just get to a place that we can store it at the, at the transmission level. And just so that you know the difference of transmission and distribution lines, the distribution lines is the ones that you see in your neighborhood. Um, that, that voltage has been dropped so that you could take it down to your home and it drops to one, uh, one tw uh, 110 and 220. Um, the transmission lines are the ones that you see the tall towers and the highway. Um, and those are the ones that are carrying, uh, I think it's 330,000 volts uh, of, of energy. And we need to figure out a way of storing there. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, and I haven't really heard about this concept too of getting our homes built with this battery. And I think that, you know, we won't have sun or a windy day to do things what we really want to do. and there's really not much of a plan or talk for that. Um, that is a really good couple points that I would probably like to discuss and research and think about that as well. Um, at the Kansas level, I would say for me is, I know Kansas has a lot more potential to do with climate change. Um, 
And I know, you know, we have great representatives, state representatives who are introducing climate change bills. Um, I feel like Kansas is a bit behind on, on that policy. And I think we can do a lot more. Um, again, with the wind energy, not only is that gonna bring, bring us um, forward with our sustainable resources, but also bring jobs and manufacturing, um, which is crucially what we need right now with our economy and unemployment at such a high level. Um, not only do we need solutions that will help now, but also invest in our future um, and for our future children and for our future families as well. Um, and I know, Michelle, you mentioned this too previously in some of your other talks, but climate change goes hand in hand with agriculture, especially with- Yes, our it does. So, you know, we also have to take that in consideration and looking at the soil and the soil nutrients and the soil health, making sure farmers don't get, you know, I guess, attacked into selling their crops to big organizations and then the big organizations taking out all the nutrients in their soil um, and making sure when we had like floods that we have a great plan for that and making sure like our, our burnings and everything is what needs to be done so we don't have other issues like green algae or you know maybe an overpopulated um, pesticides, um, pesticides and um, looking at more innovative ways too I think. Um, you know, more research and more creative thinking is always what we need. And that's one of the things I'm excited for too. Um, and one of the things I'd like to do is involve the youth because they're very passionate about um, our planet. And that goes to my indigenous values too, of always protecting mother earth, um, being a water protector. Water is one of our basic needs and making sure that's clean water. Um, I know that was kind of an issue with one of our reservations here in Kansas with the Kickapoo um, tribe where they had some water quality issues um, to the point, this was probably about five years ago. And I saw on their Facebook page one time that they advised their tribal members to not fish or hunt on the land. And I was like, something's really wrong if you tell indigenous folks to not go hunting and fishing on their own land. Um, so stuff like that, I think I'm, I'm excited for in the state level to, to be a voice of. Let's see. Any more questions? Does anybody want to, to hop in before we wrap up? Okay, looks like we have one more. What can I do to get involved in the election campaign? I'm kind of stuck at home with the whole pandemic thing <laughs> and I don't know much about how to help besides donating. Well, Raymond, have I got a deal for you. <laughs> um, we can get you connected with our awesome, phenomenal, I know, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, not, I'm not restraining myself like I typically would. I'm tired. <laughs> Marley just popped up and Marley is able to connect you with our, our team that is part of the combined campaign. We are texting and calling incessantly on a regular basis, making sure that we turn out the vote. And there is, you know, if, if, if you can't give because it's not, you know, where you're at, you can give your time and your time will be valuable and needed. And there Marley just put on the chat box, your, your entry into volunteer land. Yeah, no, um, we would love to have you Raymond. Um, like Michelle said, my name is Marley and I am an organizer with the campaign. Um, with the Kansas Democratic Coordinated Campaign. So we're making calls for um, all of our Democrats, uh, Michelle, Barbara, um, Christina, you know, everyone on the ticket. And um, we do need your help because in Kansas, we have some really close races and, you know, these, these conversations will help get us over the edge. Um, so yes, we would love to have you, Raymond. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll also put my email in here and you can send me an email. Thank you so much, Marley. You've been amazing. I know we all went to high school together too. <laughs> I was like, oh. Yes, God. Lord, hi. I love it. <laughs> um, and I know with the whole, you, if you can't donate with my campaign at a state level, um, phone calls were one of the big key players in my campaign and my success of my campaign. Um, just the good old hard fashion, hard work, um, making thousands of calls. Um, you know, us, as the candidate can only make so many calls um, a day. So 
we have volunteers who want to help make those calls for us and get the word out about our names because sometimes the average voter might not even know who the candidate is for um, for that time are um, on their ballot um, and sometimes the average voter doesn't know uh, where to vote and these are very important times to have that intimate conversation with the voter um, just just for that basis of, of that. Um, so before I wrap it up, uh, Michelle, do you have any last words? This is, we're 25 days away from the most consequential election in probably the last few decades. I was gonna say century, but there's a lot of things that have happened in the last hundred years. Um, healthcare is on the ballot. LGBTQ rights are on the ballot. So many things that we consider normal now are on the ballot. And in the middle of it, we are dealing with a pandemic with leadership that refuses to work on supporting the citizens that they're supposed to serve. And earlier this morning, one of those interviews that I was sharing with you, Christina, was an interview with the KC Star. And they were asking me if, it, what, what did I think about the negativity that is happening in Congress right now and the inability for the two parties to get together and talk? And I asked them and I said, so do you think that's, uh, that's the, the, the cause or is that the symptom? And the, 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 the person said facetiously, I'm the one that asked the questions here. And I said, no, but think about it. Is, is it a cause or is it a symptom? I think it's a symptom of a populace that is electing individuals that are doing this over and over again. When we should be prioritizing the health of our citizens, we're playing politics. And that, that is shameful. Um, we should all be working towards ensuring that people have access to COVID testing, that our doctors and our hospitals and our first responders all have access to PPE, which is personal protective equipment, that we're able to keep people safe, that we have a unified message. Because you know what? Because of us playing politics, not us, but for the policies that are being played in DC, our kids are not able to go to school. Our economy is crashing um, because we didn't make the right decisions when it mattered. So now we're playing catch up and it's our lives that are on the line. 210 souls and counting have perished in this country. Most of us know a person that has made, been sick or somebody that we know that knows somebody that passed away to COVID. And that's a shame because this could have been preventable. It's time for us to stop arguing with our brothers and sisters over a letter and start fighting together for the values and the soul of our country. It's time for us to stop gratifying and electing individuals that are so much concerned about power and getting elected that they're willing to do horrible things in the name of power because that shows immediately that it's not about service. You need to vote. And not only do you need to vote, you need to engage 10, 20 people to go and vote, especially those who you know are being told that their vote does not matter. Because it's a trap, it's a lie. And we need everybody to turn out. This seat was lost by 2,239 votes. 2,239. We can win. And it's not that we win so that I win. It's that we win so that we are taking care of each other. This is not my race, it's our race. So I encourage all of you to make sure that you get out there and vote, that you encourage others to do so, and that you remind people that they can vote from home. Um, follow up with them, have these difficult conversations, uh, tell your Republican friends that it's okay, that there's candidates that are not concerned about all the negative rhetoric, <clears throat> that there's people like Christina, like myself, who just want to serve. And it's okay. Um, and, and, and it's okay to color outside the party line. So thank you, Christina, for this opportunity. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I, I'm so excited for your campaign. You brought a lot of hope for me. And, <laughs> um, you know, if you guys want to get involved, I have also been volunteering with the Kansas Democrats and making phone calls for Michelle, for Dr. Barbara Bollier, um, for other 
state, um, you know, House representatives and state senators in the Congressional 2 district. Um, so you can easily sign up online. I think Marley might have dropped that link in the chat box. Um, they will make sure and double make sure that you guys <laughs> show up. I know I got a couple of phone calls today at work. <laughs> um, but yeah, did I miss anything, Marley? No, um, I would just echo what Michelle said about, you know, we lost this race so close last time. And um, I just know so many people are working really hard and we all have to come together to, to finish it out. So yeah, that's all I have. Yes, and of course, it's not too late to get involved in any of the campaign races as well. Um, still a lot of work and plenty of work for everyone to get um, to be involved. And even after the campaign season, you can definitely get involved in other organizations as well that have a passion for your issue um, or, or the party as well. So this will pretty much wrap up today. Thank you so much for hopping on. Thank you for Michelle De La Isla for joining us today. I know you're extremely busy, but I'm so excited that you you are running and oh, I'm just so excited. <laughs> In 20, you know, less than 30 days left of the election. Don't forget to vote everybody. Um, I learned a lot from all of you and from everyone's questions. I'm having these types of conversations almost every Friday at 6 p.m. with different community members. Our next conversation will be with the United States Senate candidate, Dr. Barbara Boyer. Uh, next Friday on October 16th, more information about our conversations with Dr. Boulier will be posted on my social medias at Hazwood for KS, so make sure to look out for that. Please feel free to always reach out to me with any ideas or information on how I can be helpful to you. Um, again, thank you all so much for hopping on today. Take care, uh, have a nice evening, and wear a mask. Bye. <laughs> bye, Sammy. Bye, Marley. Bye, everybody. Bye, Michelle. Thanks for hopping on. <laughs>